Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Eric Hanischek, the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Rick, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. Our topic today is education, and Rick's one of the world's authorities on education and many different aspects of it. But the aspect I want to talk about today is school finance, which sounds kind of dry, but Rick and I have been, you and I have been talking about it. It's rather remarkable some of the changes that have been going on in America in the last quarter century in the area of school finance, particularly the role of the courts. And as a non-specialist in the economics of education, my presumption was that most schools get their money from property taxes and that school expenditures in a particular school district are going to be a function of partially, if not mostly, a function of its property tax base. So wealthier school districts spend more, poorer school districts are going to spend less, and that's going to create some inequities. I, the back of my mind, I have some idea that there's been some attempt to even things out, but it turns out it's a lot more revolutionary uh, uh, in scope than I had thought. So give us a little bit of background on what the courts have been doing, of all things, in playing a role in school finance. Well, you're true in, uh, about this overall situation, that there's a lot of local involvement in the funding of schools, but over now some 40 years, there has been a dramatic change in both the character of that funding and who is making the decisions. We have for a long time had state policies where the state pays for part of school finance and localities pay for other parts. And the large variation in spending across districts comes from different local choices about how much they want to fund. States also uh, uh, provide extra money for kids that are presumed more difficult to educate, poorer kids, kids with special education needs, and so forth. Similarly, the federal government does. But you get a lot of the variation after that from local property tax. Starting in the late 1960s in California, there was a lawsuit that directly attacked the use of property taxes and local funding in schools. This was a case called Serrano versus Priest. It was made originally under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause, and claimed that kids who went to, who lived in districts where there wasn't much property tax base uh, were disadvantaged and weren't being treated equally. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, U.S. Supreme Court ruled that education funding was not a federal matter. But what this did was open up every state and every state court to lawsuits because every state has prominently an education clause in its state constitution. And these uh, are fairly uh, vague, if, if I remember your writing on this. Absolutely. The uh, uh, kinds of constitutional uh, clauses say things like, the state should provide a thorough and efficient system of public schools, or it should provide free and open schools to all kids, sometimes up to a certain age, other times not even specifying that. A fairly bland, pleasant statement that the state has a role in education. And yet this opened the door. How did this open the door and what happened? Well, the lawsuit in California, Serrano versus Priest, went back to the state courts from the federal courts. And the state courts ruled that, in fact, this was a real issue, that the use of property tax funding that had Beverly Hills, California, spending a lot more than Baldwin Park, California, a neighboring suburb, was unconstitutional by the California Constitution. 
this led to somewhere around 20 years of court wrangling back and forth in, in the courts with the legislature, with the governor of California, to try to find a system that would satisfy the courts in their views of the constitutionality. It also led to a very large number of other states emulating the California policy. At this point, all but four or five states have had lawsuits that relate to school finance in one way or another. Now, there's been an interesting evolution of these court cases. They originally started out as equity cases. Trying to equalize funding across districts. The idea was that, Spending, that, that districts should provide equal educational opportunities to everybody, and the courts immediately went to defining this in terms of what was spent in the different jurisdictions, and various court cases led to more equality of the spending across districts, usually by having the state pick up a larger share. So the state raises money for schools through generally income taxes, although sometimes state property taxes and other taxes, and then redistributes it back to localities. And so the more the state puts in, the more equalized spending is in some sense. In theory, at least. So that was the first level. The first type of case and the first impact was to try to was to create a role, uh, a larger role for state spending and state revenues. But that was not the only uh, thing. No, that's not the only thing. Um, I think the best interpretation of these lawsuits is that they wanted more money to be spent on education. They were using the state constitutions as a way to lever more money for schools. The simple argument, I think, by the people bringing these lawsuits was that if the courts required more equal spending, most states would not equalize by taking money from one district and giving it to another, but in fact they would level up. They would bring the bottom districts up to the top and you would get more spending. After about 15 or 20 years of these court cases, it turned out that states divided fairly evenly between those where the court said the current funding was unconstitutional and those that said it was constitutional. Secondly, for those where the court said it was unconstitutional, some states actually started taking money from high spending districts and giving it to low spending districts and equalizing rather than putting more money into the system. Which was not the goal of the your suspected goal, the advocates of these behind these lawsuits. That's right. And so they chose a different type of lawsuit, right? And in, <laughs> in the late 80s, we developed a new kind of lawsuit that has been labeled adequacy lawsuits. The argument there is, well, the money might be equitably spent across districts, but there's just not enough to provide a good education for everybody. Usually with trumpet flourishes about the need to ha meet the 21st century job markets and so forth, that more money has to be put into the schools. And what role did the courts play in uh, making that happen? Well, at this point, the courts are on slightly thin ice from a constitutional standpoint because the courts started to essentially appropriate funds, uh, either explicitly or implicitly, which is a role we traditionally reserve, reserve for the political branches of states, the legislatures and the executives of these states. For uh, Throughout the 1990s, in fact, there were several cases uh, that uniformly found inadequate spending according to these vague constitutional provisions, but that they determined that the kids weren't doing well enough. And so the obvious way to satisfy that problem was that the court should just step in and force the states to put more money into the schools. And what are some of the magnitudes that are involved in these, uh, these decisions? Well, the best uh, in terms of 
uh, standing out uh, is New York City lawsuit. There was a lawsuit in New York City that went on for a number of years, but was finally decided in the early in the 2000, 2002 or so, um, called the Campaign for Fiscal e Equity versus State of New York. This was whether funding in New York City was sufficient. New York City was, at that point, uh, spending above the national average by a fair amount of, and uh, also had kids that weren't performing very well. The lawsuit went on, and the courts originally decided that the state should put another $5.8 billion into the schools on top of the 13 or 14 billion dollars already there. So roughly a almost a 50 percent increase in spending mandated by a court, not the legislature. That's correct. That's uh, an incredible uh, bit of hubris there. <laughs> well, this obviously opens things up for serious constitutional crises because the legislature is not likely to go along with that. They had a few it, other uses for the six billion probably they had in mind. Well, the courts are making decisions entirely on this one area, education, and not considering other possible uses of government funds or maybe even private funds being retained by the citizens as opposed to tax funds. Sure. And the magnitude of this was so enormous. We were talking about essentially spending $19,000 per student per year in New York City versus a national average of under 8000 at the time. And this is what the courts said they thought adequacy was. This number actually got reduced by the state Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals in New York State, because they realized first that it was a large number, and secondly, that um, if they were so explicit about the amount of money that they might, in fact, be overstepping their uh, authority under the constitutional separation of powers in the Constitution. They reduced this amount, but still left on the table the idea that the courts could, in fact, essentially appropriate funds for uh, schools if they didn't think that the outcomes were good enough. And where is that case right now? Is it still... Is it over? The case is over. Is it being challenged? That, um, so, by the way, you said reduced, but it was still a rather large number, if I remember. They brought it down to another $2 billion per year. A mere $2 billion. Um, the reality is that uh, former Governor Elliot Spitzer campaigned on the idea that he would get the legislature to put more money into New York City schools, and the New York City schools were slated to receive enough sufficient funding that that the court uh, the case was not um, decided I mean, the amount of spending wasn't decided by the legislature uh, by the courts sort of although presumably they they influenced it in some dimension but but the constitutionality of even that smaller amount has been left unchallenged that is true because this was the Court of Appeals the highest court in the state in New of York, New York. And since it was it was a New York state constitutional challenge that's right. This is the final arbiter, um, except for the fact that we have these checks and balances. So one of the roles of the courts in schools in recent years is the uh, increasing of the decree of mandating uh, additional expenditures at the state level to be spent either on particular cities, uh, school system like, like New York's, but they do other things as well, right? So uh, I'm a um, 19, I graduated from high school in 1972. I went to high school in Lexington, Massachusetts, and we had a busing program, which was very controversial at the time, of uh, busing inner city African American kids out to the suburbs. And I think there was also a reverse flow in some situations, not every city. But as a result of that racial issue, not, not just the financing issue, uh, in a couple of cities at least, courts, quote, 
took over the schools, correct? What, what were they? What were the, what were they doing? And is that still going on? And where? There is still some of that. This is all an outgrowth of Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954. Brown versus the Board of Education was about de jure segregation of schools in the South. The subsequent court cases related to that went on to address de facto segregation in other situations in the North. A large number of districts, particularly in the South, were uh, under court jurisdiction because of racial segregation, racial balance, and that developed an elaborate system there. Those cases have pretty much died out um, because either the school systems have shown that they have done what is required in terms of racial balance, or just in the last year, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that race-based policies were actually unconstitutional. So they went to the opposite extreme and said that school systems could not develop race-based policies, of which busing and, and so forth were. Along the way, uh, that was a long history, uh, um, and probably the biggest influence of the courts ever on schools was through the racial segregation and racial balancing of schools. But when I lived in St. Louis, uh, and I know also in Kansas City, the courts did more than just bus kids, right? Absolutely they did. What the courts did was to realize first that um, people could avoid racial balancing by moving out of these central city districts. Yeah. And it was labeled white flight, um, but it was also the natural evolution of cities in the U.S. where people moved to the sub suburbs, larger lots, nicer, newer houses, and so forth, and as it, through that avoided any of the racial balancing, which was from a very early time ruled to only apply to the individual jurisdictions so that the courts didn't enter in on forcing Lexington to Boston or Boston to Lexington busing. Uh, there were some voluntary programs that were used. What happened in Kansas City and St. Louis is actually very relevant to, to the school finance matters. In the desegregation cases, uh, particularly for Kansas City, the plaintiffs who wanted more desegregation argued that um, the only way that you could get true racial balance was to attract other white students back into the district or to keep them there. That implied to the plaintiffs and uh, in an argument accepted by the judge that you had to make the Kansas City schools so good that you would voluntarily get white students there so that you would have more racial balance. This led for a period in the 90s where Kansas City was the highest spending district in the nation, at least of districts with 10,000 students or, or so. And the way that came about was that the federal judge who was in charge of the desegregation order literally told the Kansas uh, City schools, dream your biggest dream and the state will pay for it. So the state was given the bill for essentially anything that Kansas City said would be uh, a good educational device. Kansas City is also a, a, a sad case because they took this funding opportunity to build magnificent facilities, Olympic-sized swimming pools, a, a separate zoological park with the school, and so forth. Um, they put very little of it into better teachers or other things that you might think have a more direct impact on student achievement, and they got no, no gains in student achievement. So there was this huge increase in funding with no visible improvements in student achievement. And that's the, the crux of my interest in the whole school finance issue. We have courts 
who have limited power to judge what's going on in a school and to make rulings on specifics, making arguments about how much should be spent on the school district with no reason to believe that, in fact, student performance or student achievement is going to improve because of these rulings. I mean, the, the part that bothers me, besides the, the constitutionality of it, is the accountability issue, which is obviously related to the constitutionality, that most constitutional designs are designed to ideally align people's incentives with outcomes. And a judge who makes a moronic decision about a uh, funding level or various other things, there's no recourse, there's no feedback loop. There's no informational feedback loop. There's no financial feedback loop. There's nothing, it seems to me, that would, as you say, in the case of a mistake, give there, for there to be any direct incentive to, to fix it. Well, it's best understood by giving you a little sketch of how these court cases go. The standard is that plaintiffs who are representing districts that want more funding come in and present data on how a portion of each state's kids are not learning what we would hope for. In fact, No Child Left Behind, the federal accountability statute, has actually aided in these suits because it gives regular information on the achievement levels of individual kids. So the plaintiffs come in and say uh, there's a group that isn't performing very well. And I think that's real, and it's important, and it's something we should consider. And then they turn and say, well, it's obvious the only way to solve this is to provide more funding for these districts. To my knowledge, in the 40-plus uh, years in which these lawsuits have been going on, no lawsuit on school finance has ever presented evidence that some other state that had a favorable money ruling also got achievement gains. You would think that if, in fact, the Uh. issue was that we have inappropriately low achievement, that courts would ask, well, is there evidence that, in fact, ruling on funding is going to lead to improvements? And to my knowledge, the plaintiffs have never once presented such evidence to use as a rationalization because they rely on the simple everybody knows that more money will help the schools argument. And um, one reason that presumably they have not used that argument, that is pointing to school districts that have increased funding and then saw and seen increased achievement, is that that evidence is hard to come by. Absolutely. Um, There are some classic stories. I mentioned the Kansas City story. There's a similar story to St. Louis, which was a slightly different history of how they handled the desegregation suit there. But there was large additional funding with no evidence that kids were doing better. The best examples right now are Wyoming and New Jersey. Wyoming is a little western state that nobody really pays much attention to, so it's not obvious to most people that Wyoming has popped into being one of the top five spending states in the nation. It has. Uh, on a per-pupil basis. Um, and it over, did what, this, when did, over what time period did that occur? Uh, there was a court case in 1996 that has led to this dramatic increase in funding, and they've had uh, natural gas money that they could tap into at the state level so nobody's felt hurt too much. The evidence, if you look at the measures we have of National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is our national testing of a representative sample of kids, indicates that Wyoming has retrogressed relative to the rest of the nation over the period of this lawsuit. So after they had these dramatic increases in funding, their students did relatively poorer than the average kid in the U.S. who hadn't had all this funding. Must have been a bad harvest. You know, it's like <laughs> the Soviet uh, Union after re- referred to them in a recent podcast. 
you know, after 1917, they just had a lot of bad weather. And it's not that communism didn't work or the collective farms didn't work. It was, well, you know, bad, bad weather. You have bad harvest. And it lasted for about 70 years, the bad weather. So here it is in Wyoming. They get this great windfall uh, mandated by the courts. And I guess they just must have had, like, I don't know, a lot of gray days where people just <laughs> had trouble concentrating. And that offset the effect of the spending. It's an uh, unobserved variable. Absolutely. And what about New Jersey? New Jersey is different kind of state. Currently the poster child for school finance cases. The first decision on New York or New Jersey schools was I believe it was 1973. The courts have been involved in New Jersey schools in their finance for some 35 years now. The most recent incarnation of this was in a lawsuit called Abbott, Abbott versus Burke, um, where the judge declared 28 districts to be in special need. And in the late 1990s, it was either 97 or 99, the judge said that these districts should be able to spend as much as the highest spending district in the entire state. So New Jersey, Jersey City, I mean, Newark, Jersey City, et cetera, um, all of a sudden got this huge jump in their funding so that they're now spending, uh, it's hard to tell for sure, but probably about $19,000 per student in the Abbott districts versus um, less than 10,000 in the rest of the districts of the state. So those students must be twice as smart, um, doing twice as well? <laughs> there was one small observation on this National Assessment of Educational Progress that fourth grade reading scores in 2007 were up over their, their previous levels. So in 35 years, uh, the proponents of this case say, well, we finally turned the corner because we've seen for the first time an increase in student achievement. But the reality is that um, there's no way to believe that the kids of these large districts are, in fact, jumping forward and doing well in achievement. They have been given preschool education, one of the current things that we call for. They've been given more funding at all levels, summer programs, after school programs, virtually anything you can think of. And there's smaller class sizes, smaller I assume. Smaller class sizes, of course. And we can see just little to no evidence that student achievement has gone up. And it'd certainly be hard to attribute this to better funding. So who, who def two questions. One is, what, have you any thoughts on what the judges are thinking? Um, are they just emotionally um, attracted to this idea that more is better? And we'll, I want to come back in a little bit and we'll talk about that, that, the specifics of why that is or isn't the case. But you can see the appeal of it. Seems like a good thing. Uh, and there's got to be a group of people here who... Uh, defend these cases besides, obviously, the teachers and administrators and others who benefit from higher salaries. They obviously think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but uh, there must be some so-called objective voices that think this is a good thing. You and I are on the other side, but there must be some voices on the other side who aren't just self-interested, or, or am I wrong? Well, I'm on the side of, of these court cases in some sense. I think that achievement of U.S. students is low relative to other nations of the world, and I think that the achievement gaps are too large for my view of what our society should be doing. And that's what I think is the um, persuasive part of these court cases, is that the plaintiffs come in and say, achievement is not what we would hope for or what we would expect. Or what's possible. Well, that's, I guess, a little bit different. It's, yeah. They usually don't say what's possible. It's a little bit they do. 
Um, but then I think what happens, uh, the court cases are always written in terms of constitutional language and constitutional amendments, so they don't come out and say what they may or may not be thinking unless it is entirely within the realm of the Constitution. But my interpretation is that the judges say, well, the legislature just isn't doing enough. Our state should have better a better education system, and if the legislature can't do it, I'm going to try to do my part to help improve public policy. And I think that's what's driving a lot of this. The reality is that they don't have many levers, as we discussed. Uh, they have to have a ruling that they can enforce in some manner. Right. So they can't just say, Smart. all kids have to achieve at the advanced level in eighth grade mathematics because they can't enforce that. If they don't achieve, what's that mean? I guess you could shoot the, the, shoot the teachers, but uh, probably not really. <laughs> that also would have some constitutional issues. Uh, so, the re so they fall back on uh, the general argument that we believe in most cases. If we spend more for something, we tend to get either higher quality or more of the things we buy as consumers. Yep. And so we're used to thinking that if we invest more, by which we mean put more money into it, we will necessarily do better. And the judges buy on to that. Um, it seems reasonable. And I think I'm, I suspected in our earlier podcasts, uh, the first one we did, we, we talked about this, but let's revisit it. Why don't we get what we pay for in this case? I mean, it would seem reasonable that more spending on education means more education. It seems pretty straightforward, although at the international level, uh, we talked with William Easterly, and I'm sure you know his work, that a lot of mandated educational expenditures overseas uh, don't have much of an impact on education because sometimes the teacher doesn't show up. So they build a beautiful classroom. They spend a lot more money. Um, there might be new books and, and computers in it, but there's no teacher and sometimes no students because they're home or with, working with their family. Uh, that isn't quite what's happening in the United States, although I'm sure both those things do happen. Teachers don't show up and students don't show up. But it's a little more complicated in the United States. So what's going on in the United States educational system that leads to a failure of increased spending to lead to increased achievement? The simplest answer that's most satisfying to economists is to note that there are very few incentives to improve, increase achievement if you get more funding. If you, in fact, have students that perform better, you don't get any extra salary or, or much out of it. You get some personal satisfaction. Um, but your career or your salary as a teacher or as a principal is virtually independent of the performance of students. In a system like that, if you put more money in the other side, it's not that the teachers and principals are evil people, but they might well spend the money in ways that is not necessarily the most productive in terms of achievement because they're taking care of other kinds of interests like making sure their salaries are high or what have you. We have a system in which teacher salaries are unrelated to student outcomes and student performance. They come in terms of the amount of experience or the graduate degrees that people have, but neither of those has much influence on student achievement. So we put more money into it. We often do that explicitly to say, well, we know teachers are important, so we've got to get better teachers. Therefore, we should ta pay teachers more. Seems straightforward. It's a very straightforward argument um, until you realize that bad teachers like more money as much as good teachers. Yes, So if do. you pay a uniformly higher salary, you will find that everybody who is teaching is happier but that student performance is unlikely to change at least for a number of years until maybe you could change the entire group of people going into teaching, but that's unlikely. Presuming that, of course, that, that the principal would have an incentive to then pick better people down the road. It, it is a, what's funny about what I, what I find fascinating about the argument is that uh, 
on the surface, it seems so undeniable that if you want more education, you should spend more. And yet, without the incentive, it seems undeniable that you're not going to be successful. Uh, th again, y you are probably, I, I think, the person most associated with the idea that the impact of higher expenditures is um, basically zero. There are people on the other side of the debate, presumably, who are not, again, not teachers, not self-interested in the direct sense of, of getting a higher salary. There must be some advocates for higher spending who um, think that will make a difference. Or do they argue that, well, it hadn't made a difference so far, but if we just do it a little bit more, it'll finally have an impact? There's a little bit of the latter argument, but the majority of people who argue for more funding for the schools uh, start with a simple statement. If money is spent well, we will get higher achievement. And that tautological statement is, in fact, true. If we spend money well, we will get better outcomes. Right. The problem is that the system today doesn't direct money to the productive, higher achievement kinds of uses uh, as opposed to the other uses. And so uh, typically we on average don't get more money. So the people who argue for more funding... Don't get more achievement. Or more, more achievement, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the people who argue for more money uh, typically will begin with some scientific evidence that a program put in place in some school district or some state or so on, in fact leads to higher achievement, and they will use that as justification for more funding. The reality is that with the extra funding, schools frequently don't choose the particular program that was used to justify it, and even if they do, it is often implemented in such a way that they schools don't get the kinds of results that appear in the scientific article. Yeah. Now, you've looked at some of the differences across states, uh, given that, that there's this wide variation in how states have been affected by these court cases. Some, you have Wyoming, okay? Well, you said Wyoming hasn't had a big increase, but that, you know, I could, could argue that's just one state. Uh, but I assume people have looked yourself included, more systematically at uh, differences across states in, uh, in changes in achievement over time as a function of, of expenditures. And, and what have we found? Zero effect. Yeah. But there has been a number of studies that have looked at, um, again, these national tests and how well students do and how well they do over time and how funding affects that. And there is no evidence from these studies that just putting more money into the current system will in fact lead to higher outcomes. I always have to be careful here. I mean, it's not to say that money never matters. Or that it couldn't. Or that it couldn't. Um, I believe in both of those, that money can matter and money does matter in certain instances. The problem we have from a public policy standpoint is how do we ensure that it happens Fairly systematically. Occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the argument I like, I, I always find it interesting. Um, I, again, I think, as you said earlier, the, the logic of it, the intuition is so appealing. It seems obvious that, of course, if you spent more, you get more outcome. And one of the arguments you hear against vouchers uh, is that if parents were free to leave the school system and take money with them, well, school systems would have less money. This is the converse of the argument, and therefore the outcomes would be worse. And I always found that a strange argument. It's like arguing that if we allow foreign cars to be sold in the United States, American car makers will have less money, which is true. It's holding everything else constant, allowing Americans to choose foreign cars means less money for GM and Ford and Chrysler. And as a result, the claim would be in that setting, well, if GM, Ford, and Chrysler have less money, then they're not going to be able to make as good a car. But we sort of had this idea from economics that when there's competition, it's good because it encourages GM Ford and Chrysler to pay attention. And in fact, if we kept them free from competition, in fact, this argument led to, to push to an extreme, would say it's bad to have Ford and Chrysler because that takes away money from GM. 
So it would be better just to have one car company because then they could get all the money and make the best possible car. Well, the logic of that is is real. It's a bad argument. We all understand why. And the, the, it's blatantly obvious why. If there's only one car company, they don't have much of an incentive to make a good car, even though they have lots of money. So that's what we've kind of created the United States in the public school system. In the Although we, there's gaps, but fortunately, but in general, in the name of somehow creating the most money for the one entity providing the schools, we've killed all the incentives for for quality. One of the things that comes to mind is uh, a different kind of flight than we talked about earlier. Has there been in systems where little or no progress has been made movement away from the public school system? Because these mandates uh, only apply to the public system. And I know there's been an increase in homeschooling, although I suspect most of that is religious in nature. I don't know. So what's happened over time to enrollments and if we have those numbers. Do you know? The attendance at private schools has actually gone down, and that's largely because we're about, of... The, right, we're talking about proportions now. In proportions. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, not, not absolutes. Uh, the proportion going to private schools has gone down largely because of the continuing collapse of the Catholic schools in the United States. Um, and they're share has has gone from it used to be eight percent down to i think about four percent now there's been an increase in other religious schools in the private school and the private private the non uh, sectarian, sectarian yeah. schools is about two percent and has remained about that in some places there's been a movement to private schools but much of the movement of private schools was actually in response to Brown versus the Board of Education and desegregation right. arguments, and that has gone down some. What has happened is, first, the uh, homeschooling that you mentioned is probably about 1.5% of the total population is homeschooled now. There is a case where we don't even know how many kids are in mm -hmm. homeschooling, let alone whether they're learning anything. They're good at spelling. Is my, uh, you know, we're becoming a national uh, powerhouse in spelling bees. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to be limited to English, but if, uh, if international spelling bees were the rage, we would be doing very well, although I suspect they do well in other things, but I, I do know that they do seem to dominate. Now, the other, there's one other change, though, that is hopeful in some ways, and that is that there's been the introduction of what's called charter schools. Charter schools are public schools. They're publicly funded. They operate under state regulation and state scrutiny, but they're allowed to chart their own uh, plan of where, the, what kind of education they're going to give. They apply in general to the state to do something different than the regular public schools. It buys them out of a lot of the regulations that apply to current public schools. It often buys them out of having to hire union teachers. Uh, and in return, they are dependent upon being able to attract enough students to pay for, for their program. So it's a semi-market innovation. It's it not is. A full. It is. And it, in general, there have been lots of attempts in various states to really control this. Uh, the general argument that's appealing uh, in these debates is, well, we have to provide a level playing field for the public schools, so you shouldn't uh, allow the private or the charter schools out from the burdens right. that the public schools have. Right. So <laughs> if one guy's got a broken leg in the race, you got to break the other guy's leg. Precisely. you got to keep it fair. Precisely. Yeah. That's, the, that's the argument. Now, these charter schools are currently 3 or 4% of the population, and in some places they're very substantial. It varies like, dramatically by state, correct? By state. Because there's different levels of freedom. They're all chartered by states, and yeah. there's, I think, one charter school in all of Mississippi, and there's 700 in California. Unbelievable. Um, Washington, D.C. has a large portion of their students in charter schools. These uh, institutions are often fairly new, and so it's hard to know how it's all going to work out. 
some of the very best schools in the nation have been charter schools that try largely to deal with disadvantaged students in an innovative way, sort of pull them out of the bad public schools they're in and give them an opportunity. So there are the KIPP academies, for example, that have gotten a lot of uh, publicity. The KIPP academies are schools in general about handling middle schools, but now branching out into uh, high schools also that have put together a program, pretty set program around the nation that involves both socialization of students and a real emphasis on achievement and outcomes. What we've seen is that these schools seem to be doing much better than the alternative public, public schools, but there's still only a handful of them, you know, 100 or 150. These are charter schools, so they're within the public system, but they've been given the freedom to innovate that most public schools aren't either capable of or interested in. That's correct. And they've attracted students. Presumably some of them have waiting lists. And... Right. And there are a number of schools that uh, are one-off schools. That there's a, Somebody has an idea of how to better give, give a better education, and they apply for a charter and have their own school. And then there are groups of schools like the KIPP Academies that and have others a flavor. that are um, sort of a common alternative provider. Uh, some of these schools are terrible. Right. And some of them are very good. Or some of them are excellent. The difference, and, though, is that the terrible ones presumably have trouble keeping their students, and there's at least some market signal being used, whereas in the straight public, regular public schools, that isn't there. They, the charter schools tend to close down more frequently than others, uh, but it's not always for academic reasons. It's that they have financial problems of, of one sort or another. Just people don't run them well, or they don't yeah. they aren't run well, or other things. Um, and we, as I say, they're all fairly new, so we don't know how this is all going to sort out. Some bad schools continue to attract people for at least some period of time, in part because the public schools the alternatives are not very good, and in part because we don't have perfect information from which to judge these. And it's a hard thing. Yeah. It's not like test driving your automobile uh, that you can get a sense of which automobile you like. It takes a while of having your student in your child in these schools before you get any sense of that. And even then it's hard because it, you don't know the alternative, what would be possible Correct. in other schools. As an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. The reason I asked about the homeschooling and the private schools that we talk a lot about incentives in this market and the lack of them, but there is a player in the market who has, a, one would presume, a, a very strong incentive, which is the parents. Not necessarily the students, although some of the students do, but certainly the parents faced with a horrific, horrific school you'd think would do more to escape them. And yet they dutifully, if that's the right word, religiously, regularly send their kids back year after year to these schools and school systems that are failing their, their children. So it's a bit of a puzzle as to why there isn't more parental outrage. One answer you just gave is part, is part of it, which is... Uh, you don't know what you're going to get instead. You may not know what the alternatives are. You may not know that the alternatives are better, and there may not be any better alternatives. But uh, it, it is a great tragedy in America how many students are being left um, uneducated. It's very sad. So let me pick up on one part of this. Uh, some of the work I've done is trying to evaluate the quality of charter schools in the state of Texas, where I've been doing a lot of empirical work. There, what we found was that parents did, in fact, pull their kids out of bad charter schools at a significantly higher rate than out of good public, uh, charter schools. Than out of um, so, regular public schools? Uh, well, no, out of... Oh, out of we, you sorry. could look across the different charter schools, and the ones that were doing well tended to retain their okay. kids, and the ones who were doing poorly tended to have much higher exit rates and turnover. Uh, they were replaced in part by other people so that the market didn't shut them down immediately because you had more new people coming in. 
So there's some evidence that, in fact, parents can make good decisions in these markets. Um, it's it's really hard though because, uh, as I know from when my kids were in the public schools, that the schools tell them that they're doing very well, and it's hard to come up with evidence for the most part unless there's something egregious happening or you happen to be really knowledgeable about what Algebra 2 should look like right. to make the judgment that, in fact, they're not doing a good job. We're getting more information and better information from the testing of the accountability system, No Child Left Behind, but it's still imperfect. We have imperfect tests. We have imperfect information about what's the value added of the schools and so forth. The other thing, I, I, I have to make one other comment, and that, that's absolutely clear from looking at U.S. schools, and that is, as a nation, we like public schooling. We like the idea absolutely. of having everybody go to a common school, learn about the United States and our culture and our ideals in the public schools, and we like that idea. So it takes a lot of evidence that hasn't been readily available to convince parents that, in fact, the public schools aren't doing a good yeah, job. Yeah, I mean, there is a predisposition, I think, towards a romance about the public school system. Most Americans went through it themselves. Their lives turned out okay. <laughs> they tend to think that their kids will therefore do okay as well. And, of course, there are many, many school districts where the public schools are phenomenal and do a great job. Uh, so I, I don't want listeners to think that, that, we're, that everything's bad. The other thing I wanted to mention, and like your thoughts on this, is that for all of the uh, depressing data that, that are out there about the failure of public schools to educate and to emphasize non-educational factors, uh, everything from self-esteem to a beautiful gem, things that are not related to being uh, developing your brain particularly well, there is something else going on in American schools, it seems to me, which um, fosters creativity. Um, not in a direct sense. No, I don't think, I'm sure there are programs about creativity that, are, that have mixed results. But it strikes me that other, other countries, typically with their own public school system, flawed public school systems, are more uh, regimented in some way about what students learn. Our, our system is is a little too happy-go-lucky for my taste, is my, as an outsider, is not an expert on it. And yet, I suspect that one of the advantages, probably unintended, of that system is um, people are just uh, open to, to doing different stuff. Um, their brains are open to non-traditional stuff that isn't true in, say, countries where they're drilled relentlessly in algebra and math and arithmetic, and therefore they're better on test scores than our students, than American students. And yet somehow American students grow up and found great companies, create great products. Something's going on there that, and one argument is just the right hand tail, you know, a handful of people are doing this, and, but I suspect it's more than that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a very good observation and very good point. There's been increased attention to non-cognitive skills recently, the behaviors and, and partly creativity that kids have or adults in the labor force have that are really important. And there's absolutely no doubt about that. When we look for employees and firms, we want to have people that are smart and skillful, but we also look for other traits. Do they come to to work on time? Do they have good ideas? Do they identify with the goals of the firm and so forth? Uh, this argument has been used as one to essentially absolve the school systems of any problems. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dangerous, yeah, I understand. It's a dangerous road. Um, and the fundamental issue is we don't know even how to measure things like creativity, let alone to look at whether schools, as currently structured, create more of that or less of that. 
There's absolutely no evidence, for example, that I know of that suggests that we ought to put more money into the schools and that that will create more creativity. Correct. Um, With you there. There's also no evidence to suggest that um, we get more creativity by uh, having few, uh, less cognitive skills. <laughs> yeah, that's true, um, too. My own interpretation uh, is that there are things done in schools that help promote creativity. Um, they might be harmed in other societies. The classic example is always the East Asian societies that work very hard to get into higher education, the, the top schools, the colleges and universities in each country, and they take tests for this, and so they prep starting in kindergarten for do the, well on these tests. On yeah. these tests. Um, but my own interpretation is slightly different than the normal. My own interpretation is that much of this creativity we see and much of the innovation that is created in California and in the rest of the nation, in fact, is a result of the way the labor market responds to people. In the United States, uh, if you sit around Silicon Valley for just an instant, you see that there are new firms that will reward innovative and creative ideas um, in an instant and reward people who have these ideas very highly. If you go to Korea and you have a person just at the low level in a firm and that person comes up with a new idea of something different than what's being done, he is just as likely to be fired as anything else. And so, as you might imagine, people don't volunteer better ways to do things very readily because the incentives aren't there. It's really important that we start learning more about the interactions between things like cognitive skills and creativity and how they're developed and how they're used in society. At the current level, we do know that nations with higher cognitive skills do better economically, other things being equal. So if, the, if you go to around the world to developed or developing nations, the ones where the adults and the kids are achieving at a higher level, they have more math and science skills, yeah. they're doing better economically, they're growing faster, they're more innovative than other countries. It might be that there's other things going on too, but currently we have a very clear idea that higher skills of these kinds, cognitive skills, are important for individuals in terms of their own rewards and for the nation. And that's why um, I personally emphasize those so much. Uh, now these other things. We'd like to know if something that I do in the classroom would help make kids more creative. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, it, I don't, obviously, um, I don't over push this. And it's also clear that there are many, many cultural factors outside the school system that affect this creativity innovation thing, whatever, whatever you would want to call it. I think it's interesting that schools haven't, at a minimum, haven't killed it off. Um, the whole idea of schooling is a strange thing. The whole idea of, there's a wonderful song by John McCutcheon, I think it's John McCutcheon, who talks about you know, one of the things you learn in school is how to sit at, sit at your desk all day. It's, you know, it's the, one of the big things you learn. Uh, what you learn beyond that is you know, often a very mixed bag. David Henderson's pointed out it very, very nicely in his book, uh, The Joy of Freedom, how many important things in your life that you understand and perceive you didn't learn in school. Um, the quadratic equation I learned in school, I don't use it very often. doesn't mean it didn't affect my thinking processes and how the grooves in my, the paths of neurons in my brain. It probably helped, did something, but formal schooling is, is a bit of a mystery. It's a bit of a black box, but as you point out, we could certainly do better at the part of the black box we do understand. Well, let me point out one thing that comes from sitting here in California, in Silicon Valley. We're taping this, by the way, in the Hoover, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. 
And I think it's uh, July 11th is the date for, for you listeners out there. Go ahead. The 2008. Innovative firms in the Silicon Valley, which are a real engine of our uh, economy in terms of developing new technologies and new ideas, regularly hire engineers from East Asian countries yeah, that good point. have been trained in <laughs> just developing skills and learning how to solve problems. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Now, there might be other people that we want to have there, but we certainly know that there's a huge demand, and they're displacing California-educated people because the California schools just aren't producing skills at the same level yeah. that other states and other nations are. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. Give me... Um... Give me some of the policy recommendations that you would make based on our concerns about incentives and uh, the funding issue in particular. If you're given your belief that funding is not the answer in and of itself, that simply spending more is not going to make things better, uh, what can we do to improve achievement uh, for American kids? There's a fairly short list. Uh... First, we want to have very good systems of accountability that measure student performance and attribute the value added of schools to student achievement uh, so that we have that information of which students and teachers are doing well. Secondly, we want to provide direct incentives to reward people and institutions that produce high value added. One of the ways that we talked about was having more competition and choice because parents enter into making the decision about whether schools are rewarded or not. Thirdly, we want to actually use the school funding system in a way that rewards performance. Now, this is a little bit tricky uh, because we have at least a couple objectives that we think of with our funding of schools. One is that we really do want to provide equity in the funding. And so we want to ensure that kids that come to school less prepared because their families aren't as involved in education or whatever are given the resources to succeed in the schools. So that means that the funding system, in part, should uh, provide extra resources to kids that have greater needs coming into schools. At the same time, once you've done that, we want to encourage higher performance. I would have a funding system that had lots of local decision making, but then school districts and schools and teachers that showed that they had high value added should get higher rewards and the money should go with performance and not with failure. Right now, we uh, tend to do almost the opposite in many cases. If we have an identified badly performing district in a state, the first reaction is usually to give it more resources. Presumably, the worse they do, the more resources they get. Very similar to the foreign aid problems that we've talked about in previous podcasts, right? Right, exactly. You want to do a horrible job so you can get a lot of foreign aid, have a really miserable economy with lots of poor people. Precisely, and if you do better in these bad schools, you might lose this aid. So it's not that the people in these schools want to do badly, but there is a push in the other direction that says they're going to lose money if they do a lot better. My only quibble, uh, it might be a giant quibble, I don't know, with, with your policy recommendations is um, is a semantic one. It's the use of the word we. I know what you mean by it. We want to do this. We should do this. But there is no we. There is no um, educational outcomes aren't determined by a consensus or by a board, unfortunately, of, of experts or parents sitting around. It's a political process. As long as education is in the political 
sector, which I think it probably will remain, it seems um, that we'll always be just tweaking the edges, the charter school, the little a voucher experimental program. Is there any optimism for, for real change? Well, my optimism comes from two elements of the program that I just laid out. That is better information and accountability and more choice. I actually think that you need both together, frankly. Um, some people are great choice advocates, some are great accountability advocates. I think that either system fails by itself. If you have an accountability system without much choice, eventually the public schools eat away at it to eliminate any accountability or information. Similarly, if you have a choice system without good information, then you don't get people sorting out in the best ways. I think we're moving in that direction. It's an uphill slog because, in fact, as you point out, politics enters in, as I think it should. That's our system of government, that legislatures make these decisions about public use of funds. But we also know that the teachers unions are the largest spending political body in the nation. They have systematically um, been less interested in innovation and more interested in their own personal uh, interests. My guest today has been Rick Hanischek, Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Rick, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. This has been wonderful. Thanks. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.